Jupiter, is the god of the sky and thunder and king of the gods in ancient Roman religion and mythology. The name of the god was also adopted as the name of the planet Jupiter. His identifying implement is the thunderbolt and his primary sacred animal is the eagle. Jove was the original namesake of Latin forms of the weekday now known in English as Thursday originally called Jovis dies in Latin. These became Judy in French. The temple to Jupiter Optimus Maximus stood on the Capitoline Hill in Rome. Jupiter was worshipped there as an individual deity, and with Juno and Minerva as part of the Capitoline Triad. After an almost five-year journey to Jupiter, NASA's Juno spacecraft successfully settled into orbit around our solar system's largest planet on July 4th. Juno became the latest NASA spacecraft to pull off a tricky series of maneuvers to safely arrive at a distant planet. Over the next few months, Juno's mission and science teams will perform final testing on the spacecraft's subsystems and science instruments, and even collect some preliminary science data. So Juno is our spacecraft that's orbiting Jupiter, and we've been there since 2016. And in that time, what we've been trying to do is understand the origin, the interior, the atmosphere, the magnetosphere of the solar system's largest planet. So basically, Juno measures Jupiter, has measured Jupiter in a bunch of new ways. And pretty much every time we did a measurement in a way that hadn't been done before, uh, we found that our ideas about what we were going to see were just wrong. We got surprises, which is a lot of fun if you're an experimentalist like me. You like, you know, getting the new data in and making all the theorists start over. So I'll tell you a few of them out of this list. I'm not even going to try to read the list of top 10, but I'll tell you a couple of my favorites. One of them is the deep atmosphere is not well mixed. So what that means is, you know, Jupiter's this giant ball of gas, right? And what everybody thought before we sent Juno there to try to look below the clouds was if you got deep enough below where the sun shines in Jupiter and below the, where the clouds form, it's all gas. It would, it's all fluid. It would be well mixed. And you'd find pretty much anywhere on the planet looked about the same. And when you look through at depth, it would make sense. It would be smoothly varying and things. And, well, that was totally wrong. What we found is all kinds of structure with our microwave radiometer that can see beneath the clouds all the way down to several hundred kilometers, as deep as we can see, we see structure. Down near the equator, we see this ammonia region that sort of stretches up from deep to, to near the top of the atmosphere, where the ammonia is sort of well mixed. But as soon as you go a few degrees in latitude to the south of that, you find that there's ammonia near the top, and then there's a, a deficit. You're missing some ammonia, and then down below it, it, it shows up again. We find the whole atmosphere, the dynamics of the atmosphere are way more complicated than we expected. Some of the other things we found were there's a the core in the middle is extended, it's dilute, it's fuzzy. So we all knew that there ought to be down in the center of Jupiter some kind of core where the heavy elements sink to the middle of the planet, right? If it's all fluid, all the heavy stuff should be down there at the bottom. And people kind of expected a sharply delineated core down in the middle, maybe not a solid core, but three to five, maybe 10 times the mass of the Earth, maybe even 20 times the mass of the Earth, but mostly way down in the center. And what we think we found with the gravity is, yeah, that stuff is there, but it's way up higher. It's spread out and diluted up to half or maybe even three quarters of the radius of the planet. So that's really strange. And now one of the things we're trying to figure out is, is there an even denser core down in the middle that, that is separated? Uh, there's a lot new uh, uh, a lot new data to be collected and a lot of puzzles to try to solve. Um, I'll pick out another one of these is uh, the magnetic field. When we first got our look at the magnetic field of Jupiter, we found it was more complicated than we expected. And we now know that it's asymmetric. The north part of Jupiter has a much more structured, complicated magnetic field than the south part of Jupiter. Now, we knew before we got there that Jupiter had the largest magnetic field of any planet in the solar system. And we expect it, it's caused by swirling motions in the ocean of liquid metallic hydrogen deep inside the planet. So hydrogen gas squeezed by gravity so much that it conducts electricity and it can make a magnetic field. But what we didn't expect was all the structure that we see, because even though we're getting this close-up view of the magnetic field, we're not getting any closer than the surface of the planet. And so we're seeing it still from a distance, and the only way we can see that much structure is if something is going on at a shallower place than where we thought the magnetic field was generated. 
So that's pretty exciting. And then, of course, all this asymmetry is really strange that it's got all this complication in the north and it looks kind of smooth and a lot more like a regular Earth type dipole in the south. So that's another mystery. So Jupiter is mostly hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen is the lightest element there is. Here on Earth, it would float up into the sky. But Jupiter is so massive, 300 times the mass of the Earth, that the pressure is so high that you don't have to get very far into the planet, very far below the cloud tops, to get to a region where that hydrogen is compressed to something much different from what we experience here on the Earth. If you get a quarter or a third of the way in to the planet, it's squeezed so much it's a liquid. It can even be squeezed so much it conducts electricity. It's a liquid metal. So that's just the hydrogen. Now that's way down in. At the top of the planet, the top of the atmosphere, there's still hydrogen. There's helium as the next most abundant. Then there's ammonia. So the nitrogen there is bound up with the hydrogen. NH3 makes ammonia. So you have a lot of ammonia in Jupiter's atmosphere. You have methane. You have lots of different chemicals now because way up at the top of the atmosphere, it's less dense. It's not squeezed the same way, and it can let the sunlight in. And the sunlight causes all kinds of chemi chemical reactions to happen. And then it circulates because Jupiter's hot down in the middle and cold up at the top. So we've got a wide range of different elements and different chemicals, different chemical compounds. If you look at a map of Jupiter, it shows the belts and zones. So what's happening, those things are jet streams. So we've, we've known for a long time, because we can watch them from the Earth in the upper atmosphere, that they move relative to the rest of the planet, left and right. So they move in alternating directions. What we didn't know until Juno got there was how deep those things go. Now we know if you have a rapidly rotating planet and Jupiter rotates pretty rapidly every 10 hours, so more than twice as fast as the Earth, and it's giant, right? It's, it's 300 times the mass of the Earth, more than a thousand times the volume. So rotating that fast means it's really gonna affect the motions of the, of the fluid. And because it's a fluid most of the way down, maybe all the way down, we knew that doing that would tend to result in back and forth uh, jets like that. What we didn't know is how deep they go. Juno's been able to measure that and found they go 3,000 kilometers down into the planet. So understanding how that works is complicated, but we can do experiments where you spin things or spin fluids around and watch what happens. We can do numerical experiments where you try to calculate what happens. And the combination of you know the, the heat in the middle trying to escape that causes convec convection and the rotation of the planet that gives you things like the Coriolis effect results in upwelling has to spread out. And when it spreads out, the part that sp spreads out goes in opposite directions. So if you think about something rising near the equator and say, if it rises near the equator and goes a little bit north, what happens? Well, if it's right there at the equator and it goes a little bit north, now to keep up with the rotating planet, it doesn't have to go quite as fast as it did in the place where it rose. If you go a little bit south, same thing happens. So you'd expect at the equator to have, if, if air is rising, to have it move at slightly different speeds at the equator than it does north of it or south of it. And if you do it again with an X stripe and figure that out, you wind up concluding that, yeah, it sort of makes sense to have all these stripes go back and forth in opposite directions if I have air upwelling and falling back down into the planet. What you're seeing there, is, that's the speed of those jet streams, right? Plotted, that's the squiggly line. And it's plotted on top of an image of Jupiter. So you can see how the winds match up with those belts and zones with the different colors, which are different chem chemicals in the very top of the atmosphere. And then what Juno has added to that is our gravity signature. As the spacecraft flies really close to Jupiter, gravity from the planet makes it speed up and slow down not just the gravity from the whole thing, but from stuff that's close to us. If you imagine, if you flew over something that's a little denser, as you approach it, you're gonna speed up a little, and as you pass it, you're gonna start slowing down a little. So by measuring all of those things in great detail, we can figure out, among other things, how deep those belts and zones go. And the answer is they go quite deep. 3,000 kilometers is a lot deeper than many people thought we were gonna find. So this is, of course, Jupiter's most famous um, vortex.
the great red spot. It's gigantic. Um, this thing's the size of the Earth. It's been around for centuries. We've The early telescopes, images, and even hand drawings show that Jupiter had some giant storm in it. So we believe this thing is really old. How it lasts that long is a, is a mystery. Um, and in fact, some people thought, well, maybe it has deep roots. So somehow this root is going all the way down a couple of hundred miles. There's no doubt that the water which plays a big role on the Earth, and the sunlight are important at Jupiter as well. But some of the other processes is, is linked to this and showing us that these roots go down deeper than, and pass right through the water cloud like it doesn't even matter. Even though it goes down a couple hundred miles or even a few hundred kilometers, it's still a really tall storm. Um, it's, it's a pancake because it's so wide at the top, but it's the depth of it is that pancake is much thicker than what we would have anticipated. So Jupiter is certainly a gas giant. I don't think I would say it's dangerous for the long-term future of planet Earth. In fact, I'd say maybe Jupiter, you should think of Jupiter like kind of a big brother that protects us. Now it's a little bit of a two-edged sword, but if you imagine something falling into the inner solar system, like a distant comet, as it comes into the inner solar system, it's gonna interact most likely with Jupiter before it interacts with the Earth or with the other planets because Jupiter is further out and it's way more massive. And most of the ways in which something falling into the inner solar system could gravitationally interact with Jupiter would result in kicking it out away from the inner solar system so it'd be less likely to hit the Earth. Now, that's not the whole story. Jupiter's got this enormous gravity. It can also perturb the orbits of things. And I won't say, won't promise that Jupiter's gravity couldn't perturb some comet and have it result in hitting the Earth instead of avoiding the Earth. But on balance, I'd say Jupiter is more protective than it is dangerous to us. So Europa is this moon of Jupiter. And it's one of the big ones. So it's one of the, the four Galilean satellites. And what's special about Europa is that it's about the same size as Earth's moon. But as you can see in this picture, it looks really different. Um, instead of having a surface that's covered over with craters, that instead of being an old kind of battered rocky body like our own moon is, Europa is covered with ice. And we think that Europa could actually have what we call the planetary ingredients for life. And so those are things like liquid water, um, a source of energy, um, and the right chemical elements for life. So that's things like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. Um, and then as well as stability. It's no good to have, these, to have these ingredients there if you don't have enough time for chemical reactions to take place that maybe could lead to life. So again, it's a really young surface. Um, it has very few craters. You can see there's one kind of nice big crater um, there in the bottom left of that, that grid on the right-hand side there. Um, and it's a young crater. You can see these bright rays of material that have spewed out in all directions from it. But most of the surface is covered with these long linear features called cracks and ridges um, that extend for thousands of kilometers across the surface. And then there's places where the surface has been broken up into what look kind of like icebergs. And these are places where the surface has kind of broken up into pieces. It's rotated, it's translated, it's even tilted, and then it looks like it froze into these new positions on the surface. And while these look like icebergs, they're many, many times bigger than any icebergs we have here on Earth. So the Titanic wouldn't stand a chance if it was there. Um, and then we have other features that were just strange looking, these little lenticula, and these are little sort of dark spots on the surface. Um, and all of these features, plus other evidence that we got from the Galileo spacecraft, um, that was a spacecraft that was in the Jupiter system in the 1990s, suggested very strongly that underneath this icy layer at the surface, there's an ocean, an ocean of liquid water, and that this ocean could have more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. It's really exciting to think that there could be an ocean here so far away from the sun. And this really revolutionized our thinking about, about the habitable zone, about places in the solar system that could be inhabited by life. And again, this is, this is life as we know it. Um, there's also some crazy, strange life in Star Trek that maybe we haven't figured out yet. But, you know, when we're looking at life, we just have to do the best job we can. And that means until someone builds me a tricorder, it's going to be life like we have here on Earth that needs those, those ingredients that I talked about. And so here on Europa, we think that there could be this 
big ocean layer of liquid water. And we think it could be kept liquid by what's called tidal heating. So basically what happens is that Europa goes around Jupiter um, and it has about a three and a half day orbit. And as it goes around, sometimes it's closer to Jupiter and sometimes it's further away. When it's closer, remember Jupiter is you know, it's the biggest planet in our solar system, actually has more mass than all of the rest of the solar system, except for the sun, combined together. So Jupiter's huge. Its gravitational forces are massive. And so when Europa is a little bit closer to Jupiter, its surface gets tugged on, it gets stretched and pulled and elongated a little bit. And then when it moves around in its orbit, so when it's further away, surface goes down and it's this stretching and pulling as it kind of gets squished. That's what we think generates frictional heating. This is called tidal heating. And it's that friction, that tidal heating that keeps this liquid water ocean liquid. And we think this ocean could have been there over the age of the solar system. So four and a half billion years, this ocean has been sitting there simmering. One of the really cool things about Europa's ocean is that at the bottom of that ocean, there's a layer of rock. And in this rock layer, it's possible there could be hydrothermal vents. Um, and on Earth, at the bottom of Earth's oceans, we have these hydrothermal vents. And most of the bottom of Earth's ocean, you know, it's kind of boring, right? It's just kind of dusty and dirty and, you know, there's not all that much going on there. But if you're in a submarine and you're down at the bottom of Earth's ocean, and then you come across one of these hydrothermal vents, here at the bottom of Earth's oceans, we see these just abundant ecosystems. We see these places, they're like oases for life at the bottom of Earth's oceans. And they're basically using the thermal energy so that the fluids, the, the, the bottom of Earth's ocean circulates through the crust and it gets heated up. And so you get all of these great chemical materials that can serve as food for an ecosystem. And you just find these abundant life forms. And so I think if there's life in Europa's ocean, maybe it could exist in one of these places.